Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Master of Educational Technology program at UBC. This is our podcast, the Anti-Racism Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Carrie Ewart, and I'm a faculty member for the Master of Educational Technology program, what we call MET at UBC, and the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, Decolonization, and Anti-Racism Coordinator and Designer of the Anti-Racism Speaker Series. I have with me today EDI graduate academic assistant, Tamika Fisher, and our special podcast guest, Dr. Rob Eshman, who will be introduced momentarily. For our listeners, one way that we begin meetings in Canada is to acknowledge the Indigenous people on whose taken land we benefit. This is part of the broader National Truth and Reconciliation effort in Canada and at UBC. I am speaking as an uninvited guest on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Our podcast booth, our MET offices, and servers are located on this territory. A more extensive statement on our commitment to Canada's 94 calls to action can be found on the MET website as the statement on commemorating Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. We also have resources for 2022 and 2023. These calls to action invite us to commit to changes. MET has launched a series of podcasts that will explore the role of education and technology in social justice and anti-racism as part of this call. We would like to call in today's guest, Rob Eshman to speak his territorial acknowledgement. Thank you. I'm currently in Chicago, um, which is the traditional homeland of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. Thank you. And Tamika? Thank you. I'm an uninvited settler and respectfully acknowledge that I'm communicating from the ancestral, traditional, and stolen territories of the Musqueam people. I am and my ancestors are from the island of Honshu in Japan, although my settler grandfather was born on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Suwassen, and Kwantlen First Nations, and my settler mother was born on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lower Kootenai First Nation. I'm grateful to the Musqueam First Nation for the privilege of studying, living, working, and recreating in this life-giving place and thank them for their stewardship. I recognize my responsibility to take action to reduce the racism, oppression, and harms Indigenous, Indigenous peoples have experienced and work towards reconciliation. Thank you, Tamika. Now, the Master of Educational Technology program, or MED, educates professionals on the use and impact of digital learning technologies. This fully online graduate program provides a unique opportunity for our students to engage in topics such as the role of ed tech in racism and anti-racism. Since the degree program was launched in 2022, close to 2,000 individuals have enrolled in the UBC MET program, with more than 450 students enrolled currently. MET dedicates itself to supporting its learners, stakeholders, and the public to make a positive change in communities. What is the speaker series about, and what are we talking about in this podcast? The purpose of the speaker series is to acknowledge the commitment that every individual has to inclusivity and to addressing systemic racism. With a focus on anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, and anti-people of color racism, this series seeks to identify the responsibility educators and leaders have to facilitating and supporting anti-racist approaches and strategies within their practice to enhance and transform learning environments and learning cultures. With a specific directive being digital technologies, presenters and guests will discuss racism and tools to support equity, diversity, and inclusivity, and the changing dynamics of the digital age. As a result, at MET, we are committed to a follow-up to each presentation of the speaker series with a call to action challenge. We invite every listener to make one change this month, no matter how small, and to share it with us as a next step to this podcast to eradicate racism through community building, education, and through the use of educational technologies. This call to action provides you with the opportunities as listeners of this podcast to build on the anti-racist content from the session and make steps towards change. For example, you might indicate what you have heard about and learned about from this podcast with a lesson plan that brings awareness to the issues of racism for students, colleagues, and friends. We will provide you with more details about this call for proposals at the end of the podcast. The topic today for today's podcast is when the hood comes off, racism and resistance in the digital age. On today's episode, we are so honored to welcome Dr. Rob Eshman. 
Dr. Rob Eshman is a writer, sociologist, filmmaker, and educator from Chicago. He's on faculty at the Data Science Institute at Columbia University and Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Dr. Eshman writes on educational inequality, community violence, racism, social media, and youth well-being. His research seeks to uncover individual group and institutional level barriers to racial and economic equality, and he pays special attention to the heroic efforts everyday people make to combat these barriers. Dr. Eshman's recently released book, When the Hood Comes Off, exposes the impact of digital technologies on racial dynamics and discusses the internet's potential as a tool for innovative resistance. It's a timely topic that would interest many students, as well as any educators, parents, guardians, and or activists that are concerned with what people of color experience in the digital space. Welcome, Dr. Eshman. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so nice to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do, the evolution of this work, and where your passion comes from for this work? Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to, to be a part of this series and to be speaking with you today about my book um, and broader work. Um, so I, I'm someone who studies um, education and race, you know, broadly speaking. I got into this field because I read a book called Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozol, which talks about the inequities in ed educational funding and how that leads to inequities in educational outcomes and how that leads to inequities in economic and, and life outcomes and, and, and whatnot. And so I think that seeing that the connection between um, us failing, you know, poor and black and, and, and you know, folks of color um, in schools and seeing that connection to social stratification later on in life is something that made me want to be, be a person who did research that had an impact on educational reform. Um, and so that is what got me into academia. I spent a lot of time working in ed reform. Um, working in schools, uh, doing research uh, right on on kind of K K through twelve education, and then now over the past decade, I've, I've have been studying the ways that technology changes how we experience, understand, and respond to racism. That's what my book is about. That I'm talking with you about uh, today, um, and so this is this this has been you know my my work has evolved as I have questions that I need to answer and that I feel are important, and I, I kind of follow those questions where they lead. Um, and, you know, my, in, in, in my post book work, which maybe I'm getting ahead of myself to talk about, I've been exploring storytelling as a potential form of, of anti-racist intervention um, that kind of following up on some of the things that I found in my book around resisting racism um, that we'll, we'll get to talk about in a little bit and, 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 and now using um, film to to explore the, the causes and consequences of different ways of challenging racism in in, in um, you know, in face-to-face -face settings. And so I'm, I'm very excited about using technology as a tool to try and, and awaken people to the realities of what racism and then also to challenge it. Wow, thank you so much. Tamika? Um, so you're talking, you know, it's, it's wonderful the work that you're doing, it's so important. Um, those types of inequities um, are happening, of course, here in Canada as well. Um, so what would you say to administrators that would be um, really important that would address these types of inequities? Uh, in the school system? Mm -hmm. You know, that's tough. I think that that a lot of, you know, I think that, that the research on ed reform is strong and that we know what the inputs are that we need in order to get the outputs that we're looking for. We know that increasing resources in underprivileged schools is going to, you know, improve outcomes. Um, but we, we, you know, at, at a school level, administrators don't always have access to those increased resources. But I think that we, we also um, understand that there are ways, you know, um, that, that resource poor or kind of, uh, um, you know, places, schools that don't have a lot of money, but but have taken advantage of resources in their community can also um, be effective. So from things from getting parents involved to um, kind of building a culture among teachers um, that, that, that they are not, um, you know, that they are taking responsibility for how students perform. I think it can be easy 
um, when you see kids fail year after year to, to kind of externalize that issue um, that, that, you know, I, I think I would, I would say to take a look at a book called so much reform, so little change by Charles Payne and think through the ways that the, the system and structural issues have um, impacted how we, we think about um, our youth and, and think about reform efforts and figure out what can we do to increase the capacity of the people in the, in the school to not feel beat down by, you know, years and years of, of kind of this persistence of, of failure um, and not having the resources that, that, you know, that would make our job easier. Thank you. So congratulations on the publication of your new book, which is the title of our podcast today as well. When the Hood Comes Off, Racism and Resistance in the Digital Age. Can you provide a brief overview, please, um, of your book and then discuss the inspiration and personal experiences and events that have motivated you to delve into the intersection of racism and digital age resistance in your writing and explore this specific topic? Absolutely, absolutely. So the the book explores how online communication is changing the way that we understand racism, the way that we experience racism. Um, sometimes racism online is a little bit more um, overt uh, than than is the norm in face to face settings, and so we have different experiences, and then also different ways that we respond to racism. Where um, you know, I got into the book um, looking to understand the impact of more explicit racism on folks of color online and then was surprised by finding the ways that 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 you know we as people of color use technology to resist racism and and you know new and innovative strategies that that are very different than um excuse me than than what the literature describes um and so i think that 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 my book tells this this story first of, of technology unmasking racism and revealing it to people who thought that it was hidden and second of of the way that we resist racism online um it is a book that is very you know it, I, I was intentional about writing it for a popular audience so it's not just something that i want to be read you know read in academia um, but it's also very data driven um, i draw on 86 interviews from students and um, college students in five different cities los angeles chicago um, Atlanta, Boston, and New York. Um, I also have, you know, a nationally representative survey, you know, of over 1,500 people. And then I um, use tens of millions of tweets um, gathering social media data over a decade to look at trends and how people have, have been talking about race and racism online. Um, so very data-driven. Um, you know, this is the, the book is really a culmination of about a decade of, of work for me. And, and, and so I'm very excited to... to you know, um, have it out in the world after, you know, all these different studies that I've done trying to understand how technology is shaping, you know, our experiences with racism. Um, yeah. That sounds amazing. And I've recently finished your book. And what I love is that it's an easy narrative to follow, yet it's supported by that empirical data and um, some really, really great etched out pieces and examples of how this is very explicit online as well as in person. But typically, I think this comes down to your very intriguing title, um, When the Hood Comes Off. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about that, elaborate on the significance and how it reflects the themes of your book? And as Absolutely. a part two of this question, I have a kind okay. of two part here. How has the digital age transformed that dynamic of racism? And what role does technology play in shaping resistance movements? So I feel like this is all part and parcel. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 these are some big questions. So first of all, thinking about um, the you know the title of the book and then also the cover, right? If you if you it's the um, it's the image of a KKK hood. So when the hood comes off, I mean, if we think about what the hood means, it may be the most recognizable symbol of racism in the United States. Um, and we think about what, you know, why did, why did the KKK wear the hoods? One of the reasons was to conceal their identities, that these were doctors and lawyers and pastors and farmers and, and shopkeepers who, even though they were, you know, you know, in, engaging in domestic terrorism during a time when the police were not really investigating crimes against black folks, they wanted to protect their identities. And so by wearing the hood, they were able to anonymize themselves. Um, and 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 hide hide their racist acts behind this hood hide right hide their identities. 
Um, and I think that, that you know, one of the things that, that I see as being kind of a, a theme in the book is um, that, that nowadays racism hides behind a different type of hood. It hides behind the hood of subtlety. That where is racism and that during the Jim Crow time in America, right? So before the classic years of the civil rights movement, racism was the law of the land. Racism was legal. Um, and, and because racism was legal, people would, you know, were fine admitting their racism. You don't have to hide your racist ideas when racism is the law of the land. And so this meant that racism was more overt, more in your face. Um, people were often more willing to admit their racism than they were to act on it. Uh, one of the studies I talk about in the book um, took place in the 1930s, where a sociologist sent a survey to 250 different restaurants um, and hotels, asking them, would you serve? A Chinese person in your establishment, and over ninety percent said no, we would not. But then, when that sociologist, uh, who was white, went on a road trip with a Chinese couple to these two hundred and fifty establishments, only one turned them away. So people were more willing to admit racism than they were even to act on it when it came time to choose money or this ideology of racism when someone comes to my store, right? Um, and nowadays we have a, a very a very different situation where people no one is willing to admit racism even even the racist right even the racists who are relatively open um, don't want to say yes I'm racist they don't want to own that title that we see racism as being something that is abhorrent old fashioned something that died with the civil rights movement so we shouldn't uh, have to keep talking about it um, and 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 I think that 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 you know for for folks of color who experience racism for people who study racism educators activists scholars. Um, we understand what racism looks like, even under the hood, even when it's masked, be, you know, behind everyday friendly interactions or embedded in institutions or policies or programs. We can still see it, but everyone can. And so um, for me, what I, I refer to is something I call un the unmasking of racism in online spaces um, where people can see racism for the first time based on something they experience on the internet, whether that is seeing explicitly racist language and realizing, oh, there are people who still think like this, or seeing a video of police violence against an unarmed Black person, or video of white folks calling the police on Black people just for existing, whether it's barbecuing or bird watching. Um, but these are things that can unmask racism and reveal the ways that everyday people, um, right, everyday institutions can reinforce racist um, ideas and 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 um, you know uh, and, and act violence among on um, on communities of color um, and this unmasking of racism is something that I talk about in the book how technology is unmasking racism its effects on people of color and society um, that's part one and then part two is looking now at resistance and how is it that we are using technology to change the way that we respond to racism uh, in the moment and then also in, in a broader sense with our political movements. Amazing. And I think there's so many incredible sites now, Social Justice League and looking at algorithmic bias within um, different areas of, of the digital age it speaks to that importance of unmasking and revealing. And it's so interesting that people hide behind the keys of, you know, of their message board and that when exposed, they're not willing to admit that. Thank you so much. Tamika? Um. Thank you, Carrie. As you start off in your book, you share an example of your first interaction with online racism when video gaming in college. Um, and even before that, video gaming with your cousin. Um, can you speak to this experience in relation to the impact of social media and in this example, um, digital gaming on activism and how the digital landscape has influenced the way people engage with is issues of racism? Okay, you, uh, you all are hitting me with these two part questions here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so in the first part, I, I opened the, the book with a story about the first time I was called the N word um, was while playing video games. Um, and this, it was a situation where this is a game that I played all the time with white friends at college. And when I went to hang out with some of my cousins over winter break who were all right, also black, that they just did not use the headset because they were worried about getting called the N word. It happened so often. So I experienced that myself. I'm going to realize, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like you. Well, we have to unplug this headset in order to have any fun because we're getting called the N-word every time we speak into the microphone. Um, so when I went back to college um, and now I'm playing with my white friends, some of whom were also playing the, the same game online over winter break, it just made me wonder, are any of them using this type of language, right? If everyone that I 
you know, bumped up against online uses this language. Does that mean some of my white friends do too in private? And, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. And I didn't necessarily seek to find it. I didn't do a, a survey or, or interrogate anyone. Hey, do you ever use this language? But it just, it, it led me to ask the question, right? What, what can I learn from online racism? What does online racism have to, you know, to teach us about racism in the real world? How are they connected? And that is a, a big driving question of the book is trying to understand the relationship between these two worlds, the digital and the physical, which we often see as being distinct, but really are more interconnected than, than, than we, um, you know, tend to realize. Um, and so, right, so this, so I think that absolutely the questions of the book are driven by some of my own personal experiences. Um, in terms of, I think we're going to talk more about resistance in a broader sense, but I think you're asking about resistance in terms of kind of gaming. Um, I will say that that I had an experience years later where a friend of mine invited me, you know, we're playing Call of Duty and a friend invited me to um, play with some of his friends that he was in a clan with. And all that, right, this, the friend who invited me was black and all the, the guys in this clan were white and Southern. And they had the, these Southern drawls and the, you know, the type of accents that if you stereotype racist that you would, you right, you assume all these guys are from the South. This is what racism sounds like, right? And again, I don't believe that that's what racism sounds like, but then this is a feeling that it can give us sometimes, right? Um, and, right, and, and I'm you know thinking about myself a, a, a long time ago too, and um, so I'm playing with these guys, and I'm kind of texting my buddy like, who are these guys that you have us playing with? And at this point in my life, I'm very careful about who I play with. I don't want to talk to anyone random because I'm just am avoiding racism. I want to be happy and relaxed when I'm playing video games. And after our first game, we're in the lobby, and we're talking publicly, and of course the N word gets thrown out as it always does when you're talking in a public lobby. And these guys exited the game, and one of the one of the 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 you know the people we were playing with remembered the username of the person who had used the N word, and everybody paused their game in order to all collectively report this individual. And this was a practice that this clan engaged in. That every time they ran up against someone who used language like that, they would stop playing, and then now you have ten people reporting you at the same time which means people are getting suspended. And I think that they're right. This is an example of resistance against racism where, right, uh, it, it's difficult to moderate, but then when people take the time as a group, this is a collective action, not one person doing it, that they're able, right, they're, they're probably some people who had to take a little vacation from their video game systems because when you, when you get reported a lot, that's when Microsoft or PlayStation decides, okay, you can't play for two weeks. If it happens again, you can't play for a couple months, um, right? And, and, and so I think that, that is one example of how things have changed a little bit with video games. I know, um, you know, when my kids play, I, I just know how to cut off the setting for them to be able to hear the voices of strangers, that they can only hear the voices of their friends who they want to play with. And that's something that, you know, that I try to do to protect them. But then I also prepare them that, you know, they, that they ex you know, they exist online as they do. They're going to find ugliness. And I just want them to be comfortable discussing what they see or hear with me so that we can, um, you know, we can navigate that together. You know, that's it's what you said is so powerful, the the, the act of resistance, but also um, I think it shows our listeners and watchers that this is happening to their children you know there's this is happening to um their friends children you know and it's 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 got to stop you know and mm -hmm. the, and each act that we take matters you know i think sometimes people feel oh i'm just one person but it does matter and it does make a difference and when you get a group of people together on the same page about taking those um, actions, it can really, um, really make a difference. So, absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just to, right, I think that um, while I open with the, this example of video games, I don't really talk about video games again throughout the book. That I'm more, I'm more talking about experiences that we have with racism. It, it could be on campus and face-to-face -face settings, or it can be online. I talk about both. And I think that that's something that stands out to me that from what you just said is this, this idea about the, the impact, does it matter? And I think that, um, you know, there's a, uh, I have a chapter about responding to racial microaggressions or microaggressions are kind of subtle racial slights, things that are not overt enough 
for you to tell HR and get someone in trouble, but then they, they are hurtful. We know that they have a negative impact on health and mental health and educational um, outcomes. Um, and the research says that the most common way of responding to racial microaggressions is to just not respond at all. And one of the reasons for that is people believing that it's not going to have any effect, right? Other reasons, you're not sure it's racism. It happens too quickly for you to come up with a response, right? That you're scared of losing friends. You don't want people to think you're too sensitive or too militant. If you can't take a joke, then they won't invite you out for drinks the next time. And so you stay silent. And that means that people of color typically experience, um, you know, the, the, uh, racial microaggressions, uh, um, internally that we can talk about them with our friends afterwards, but we don't say anything in the moment. So we're, we experience this harm in silence. Um, and, and that one of the things that I, that I found and, and the, you know, this most exciting in the book is that online, that this, there are very different norms that online, I had a student tell me, he talked about a, a racist joke that, that a, a white woman made online. And he said, or he, he told me about the response where people are clapping back in the comments and, and that carried over to, face-to-face -face interactions. And he said, there has never been a situation where someone has made a joke or a comment like that where no one has stood up to say that's problematic and here's why. And I just think that this is a, this is a huge difference um, in terms of the dynamic that, that we expect when it comes to how we respond to racism. And part of that is because this is communal, it's collective. If you don't have the time or energy that day, but this comment is made in a public online space, someone is gonna have the time, someone has the energy, someone sees it as being their activism to make that statement, right? If you, do you, you're not sure how to respond, you can take the time and think about how to respond and then type something up that really represents what you wanted to say that you didn't have time to say in the moment, right? Um, and so I think that the technology enables this 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 distinctive style of, of resisting racism that can be can be very empowering. So many microaggressions, and I have experienced what you're talking about. You know, they being sort of in shock almost in the moment, um, and not knowing how to respond. So I think, um, you know, what with what you're saying, you're speaking to a lot of people's experiences, and I'm so glad that we're having this uh, discussion. Me too. Mm -hmm. Me too. And I think it goes to show to the action action needs to be taken. And it's through education, it's through conversations, it's through um, really looking and engaging critically at your own inherent biases, your own stereotypes, your own assumptions, and how those can be altered through these critical conversations and this critical dialogue. How might you explore the intersectionality of various social issues within the context of racism and resistance? And how might those intersections and these intersections manifest in this digital realm? I think intersectionality is central here. Um, if I can use, right, so I, I talk a little bit about the big social movements, right, the movement for Black Lives or, or you know, um, Me Too and, and things that we've seen online. But I, I, I focus the book mostly on regular everyday people and how the, you know, like what these changes in racialized interactions look like when they're not trending, when they're not making the national news. Um, but I need to bring in here something from the movement for Black Lives because I think it's important. When we look back at the classic civil rights movement, um, much of what we think Martin Luther King wrote was either written by Ella Baker, who was a, a Black woman, who was an organizer, who you know, um, built the infrastructure of activist communities in the South for decades before the classic years of the civil rights movement. Um, and, and Bayard Rustin, who was a black gay man, who was one of the architects of the, you know, the, the black American nonviolent political strategy, um, and who is a hero who actually has uh, the movie Rustin just came out on Netflix a couple of days ago, and I haven't watched it yet, but it's exciting to see the story told in a mainstream setting. That the right, this is a, a black woman and a black gay man who were central to the civil rights movement, but they have not typically been taught in schools. And right, and and I think that um, this is something that is unique about the movement for Black Lives that intersect that it is intersectional at its core, that it is intentional about centering the perspectives of queer and women of color, um, and and instead of putting them to the sidelines because we need the straight black man to be the leader. And I think that that is something that permeates all of the of the movement is that we are we're saying that that right um, that, that coming from the Combahee uh, River Collective, 
that once black women are free, everyone will be free because it will necessitate the breaking down of all systems of oppression. And I think that that is something that we're starting with now is that understanding that we can't maintain the patriarchy while trying to fight racism, that the, the patriarchy and white supremacy go hand in hand and that we, right, that we need to be breaking down multiple systems of oppression at once. I think this is something that comes out in the book a lot is, is for example, the, the case study that started this, this project was when there was a, um, a campus based website. So there's a college campus where, um, a website was created that allowed students to post anonymously to engage in politically incorrect conversations, politically incorrect, right? Um, but it just turned into a place that was known as being horrifically racist and homophobic. And so the hate that came was, you know, racist hate, but it was also homophobic hate. It was also sexist hate. And I think that these things are right, and, and it, it, right, it, it led to many people to believe, okay, so this must be the straight white men who are making these these comments because um, you know they're hitting everyone who's not them, right? But I think that that when we're talking about online racism, it's never just racism; it's all it's always uh, um, online hate in, in in a more intersectional sense. I think that, that comes out um, in the book a lot in terms of of, of folks discussing the the ways that they, uh, especially, especially as people d discuss the evolution of their racial consciousness and their understanding of how racism is not just at an individual level um, and someone hating people of another racial group, but it is connected to systems of oppression. And when you start looking at things systematically, structurally, then you start to understand that, right, that the, the kind of the, the, the ways that, that we organized stratification of society are based on these various isms um, and that we cannot fight one without fighting the other. So I think that that is something that I am, um, I, I try to pay homage to the, to the folks who, have, who, who kind of have been leading the way and, and thinking about issues of, of racism and anti-racism and inter, with the intersectional lens um, before me. And then, I, and then I also highlight the ways that the people that I interview and talk to um, do the same thing. Um, and, 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 you know, and even, you know, I think in, in chapter six, I, I, I explore um, kind of a digital resistance on Twitter. And one of the, 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 the themes that comes out of this is the self policing in the black community where black folks are saying, we need to investigate the people that we allow to have, to have a platform and a voice because I can't be out here supporting someone who is a transphobe. Right, this idea that right that that we are now being intentional about not allowing people to um, to be leaders if they are not consistent with their values across different types of, of or different forms of, of oppression or marginalization. Thank you so much, and we see even from um, Kimberly Crenshaw's work that starting of intersectionality and looking at it as this metaphor for understanding those multiple forms of inequalities and disadvantage. And you speak innately as well as explicitly about the challenges, but also those opportunities. And so can you sort of expand on what challenges and opportunities you see in the digital age for combating racism and really fostering that resistance? That is a great question. Okay, so first, let me talk about opportunities, because um, challenges, I think, are, are evolving. Opportunities is the, e is the easier part of your two-part question here, right? Um, during the classic years of the civil rights movement, part of the nonviolent strategy was this idea that if we show the world what racism looks like, how ugly it is, they will change their hearts and minds. There's a belief in the innate goodness of other humans that they do not, they will not be okay with seeing citizens and human beings treated in this way and attacked by dogs. So that meant that part of the strategy was to get the media to be there to have their cameras turned on during during these protests. And mainstream journalists weren't always um, excited about telling that story. And so that is something that was a problem or a limitation, um, you know, kind of kind of with. You know, with, you know, with, with old school um, organizing where we did not have access to the media on our own. Nowadays, things are a little bit different. Um, and so a friend of mine, Jacob Groshek, did a study looking at 
um, hubs for information sharing on Twitter during the protests in Ferguson and found that Black activists were bigger hubs for information sharing than were traditional um, legacy media journalists and outlets. So this is huge because it meant that Black folks on the ground were able to bypass the media knowledge gatekeepers and get information to the world without the elites who 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 manage uh, these these mainstream media institutions deciding this is the story we want the, the world to know about. And that is just a huge advantage that we have in terms of resisting racism is the ability to go straight to the people. Um, and um, you're right. And so I, I see that as being right. Uh, the, the answer to part of your question is there's a huge advantage in having social media that if we can make something trend by ourselves, it means we don't have to wait for the person who runs CNN or NBC to decide to to tell that story, that the story is out there and, and the news companies have to now tell the story because it's trending, you know, somewhere else and they don't want to be left behind on, on, on what we're talking about. Now, I think we're also in a moment where we're faced with the possibility and maybe the beginning realities of social media giants being the new gatekeepers and having the ability to use algorithms or um, oppressive mo moderation to stop people from telling some of these anti-racist, anti-oppressive, right, anti-colonialist stories that we that we uh, um, see sharing on social media as being empowering of, of groups who who have traditionally not had their stories told. But if right, if if, if you know, Facebook can and Twitter can limit the sharing of those stories, then we're back to where we came from, where we don't have that type of an outlet to get these stories out. I think so. So I think that that is a limitation and that we are facing now and, 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 and that that we don't fully understand it or how to get around it um, is that that we can we are seeing social media companies become the new gatekeepers of information, which is limiting um, the, you know, the, the kind of the potential for justice that we have seen with uh, social media over the past decade. Excellent. Thank you. Well, we have a recent bill, uh, C-11. And it excludes social media, different uh, media sources for producing media in that respect. And there's only these particular media sites that are allowed to um, showcase stories and headlines and things like that. So it's it's really limiting the spread of misinformation, disinformation, and it's leaving it to social media or it's leaving it to the um, actual media sites. However... We always examine from whose perspective is this media shared, is this information shared? And I think it's really important what you're saying is finally within this example of Twitter or X, um, that these massive hubs, they're over, they're overshadowing um, the dominant voices, typically the white cis male voices of it all, and actually finally having a say and being able to get that information out to all peoples. So thank you very much for that. That was important. Mm -hmm. Hamaka? Um, um, what, what do you think um, this might, this all might look like on a global scale? Do you have any thoughts about, about that? I think that we have seen social media at the center of um, movements around the globe, um, right? Think about things like the Arab Spring, but we are, are also seeing the ways that governments can shut down social media and so again i think it's the same it's the same question of so i mean so there, there are multiple issues here so one is can we turn twitter-based explosions and movements and moments into sustained um movements for change and that that includes transitioning to physical activism and organizing um, as well, and not just relying on, on only online activism, but then also understanding that oppressive regimes around the world have the capability of limiting access to technology. And that is a, a limitation of social media based movements. Um, is it is it possible for, um, you know, to, as te technology improves that that it's harder and harder to shut things down yeah potentially right i think it, it, it's, it's interesting right because where we see elon on both sides here that on one one hand when israel shut down the internet in palestine that elon musk said oh i'm going to use satellites to get everyone in palestine internet but then now on twitter he's saying that right to talk about decolonization is uh, a hate crime because it it, it implies genocide of, of the israeli people 
And so, right. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what, what's going on with him, but I know that, right. That, that it's just an example of how technology can be used on both ends that you can shut down a conversation about an ongoing issue, or you can, right. You can empower people to have access to share their stories when the, you know, the, the people, right. The people in power and their, country are pre preventing them from having access to technology that would allow them to share what's happening. Um, and so I think that, that we, right, so from a global perspective, um, you know, that not everyone has as much tech access to technology as we do in the U.S., but we're seeing, you know, from Palestine to the United States that there are ways that the that, that social media companies can limit um, the extent to which we can talk about, uh, um, you know, issues that, that are affecting people's, you know, um, lives every day so much power and so few hands mm -hmm. yeah Terry. thank you so we look at the envisioning for the future contributing to discussions such as these about racism resistance in society and the execution of these um, teachings in different ways so what would be your hope for your readers, the impact that this book, for instance, these teachings, these discussions has on your readers? I would hope um, that one, that my readers think about the, right? So, so a lot of what I describe is interpersonal as I have a very structural, I discuss racism in a structural way to understand that, right? That the, the function of racism is to legitimate racial inequality. It is to, to justify racist policies, right? Um, but then I also am talking a lot about interpersonal experiences, whether in face-to-face -face settings or online. Um, but, and, but I really want people to understand the connection between the interpersonal and the structural, is it right? That these interpersonal experiences are like the scaffolding that, that racism is built on, um, that the reproduction of racist ideologies is, is built on our silence and our allowing them to continue. And so what I would like for people to to take from this is one to um, that the more that we expose racism and unmask it, the more visible it is that this weakens racism. The racism is mo is going to be most effective and efficient when it is silent, when it is invisible, when when most people don't notice it, when people don't stand up against it, and it it just is allowed to reproduce itself to reproduce racial inequality without people questioning these processes, right? Um, and so the more that we name racism, the more that we weaken it. And whether we're, we're naming a structural issue that we want to point out through an article or whether we're challenging the ways that our, we or people around us are being treated uh, um, and, and, you know, and, and discriminated against. And so I think that that naming and challenging and standing against racism, even when it seems like it's a micro act, has the potential to have a macro impact on the world and that we are stopping racism from reproducing itself in that moment, in that instance, and we are potentially building more people who understand how racism works, they can go out and do the same thing. Well said, and I think it's through both informal and formal education that that can happen. Just having educators specifically, even K to 12 classrooms, open these conversations to that personal um, level experiences and how students, you know, as young as preschool and kindergarten are experiencing these microaggressions, what that looks like, and how you can combat basically the systemic racism that's happening within um, impersonal, personal, and then informal and formal environments. So thank you so much. Tamika. Um, you, you've um, talked about it um, in in your last answer um, about how you would like people to um, look at this issue. And now, how would you like our audience members of this podcast and anti-racism speaker series um, engage with the ideas presented in your book and what conversations you aim to spark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to have people talking about where racism lives near to them. I think that many of us can can say that we're anti-racist, can say that we don't like racism, and be blind to the ways that we may um, be right be, be engaging in harm um, in our in our communities um, or with the you know with the the policies or people that we support 
uh, more broadly. And so I think I would like for folks to have a conversation about where is racism hiding in their own circles and what can we do to root it out? Um, and then also to, 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 to think about being a, a part of a collective and communal resistance effort around the globe. Um, and so, you know, getting involved in, in organizations or protests and, and finding ways to continue to grow and learn. And I think that the more we learn about racism, the, the, the you know, the bigger uh, and, and more discouraging the problem may seem to be, but also the more we gain insights on how um, we, you know, it, it can be stopped. And so, and so I think that I would, you know, I would love for folks to continue having um, this conversation, especially in, in, in terms of finding ways to stay involved um, and, and being a part of the solution, even after the kind of the, the you know, the trending interest dies down um, around, you know, current events that can, that can often cause brief bumps in, 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 in activism. Yes, it's having that sustained movement um, because time after time you see things on the news and and then you know there's a lot of protests and activity and then it's not until the next news um, piece that it goes up again. So good food for thought. Carrie, the unfortunate out of sight, out of mind mentality of it. Um, and so with that said, as we conclude the podcast. I'm interested in basically what your view is on ways and what does this future look like in terms of the intersection of racism and resistance in the digital age. And you did speak to some really great implications as to where to go from here, but just son, your final thoughts in terms of what the future holds. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that I, I am someone who is optimistic here, uh, maybe foolishly so. But I believe that that as we continue to make racism more visible to the general population, that I think that the national conversation, international conversation about race and racism has has grown a lot in the past decade. And I expect to see more and more people who are unwilling to continue to be satisfied by the status quo. Um, and I think that that, that um, should lead to us starting to elect folks who are, um, you know, who, who, who do what the people want. Um, something I'm scared of is a move towards fascism and that, that the people who are in power will want to hold on it, want to hold on to, to power more than they want to hold on to democracy. And I think we see some signs of that now. And I think that that, that may be where the fight is, is that we are waking the people up, but then, um, you know, the folks who are in power may not be so interested in, the, in, in an awoken um, populace. Um, and so that this is something that we have to fight against. And then, of course, you know, misinformation is a problem that, that we haven't fully solved either. So I think there are lots of issues for us to um, to tackle, but I, I, I remain optimistic. I think if history teaches us anything, it's that, you know, it always seems like the problem is too big for us to solve. Um, but I, I, I hope that we're able to look back on this time now and see that the the commitment that people made to making changes um, you know, in, in their communities, in our society, um, had an impact and, and it is going to change the world that our children and grandchildren will grow up in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to our guest, Dr. Robert Eshman, for your thoughts, impactful and enlightening responses that addressed the, the issue of the spaces that racism inhabits, I think. You know, you've talked, um, you know, about the digital spaces, um, about on college campuses, face-to-face -face conversations, um, the microaggressions, um, and the fact that, you know, each person has a responsibility to um, stand up in their, the space that they inhabit um, mm -hmm. and, and do something and say something. So, very Thank powerful. You. Thank you. It really was. I think you helped us unpack that anti-racism piece in a very clear and dynamic way. You shared so many thoughtful and necessary points, which have an impact for so many. And for listeners that are inspired by this series, Dr. Eshman has a book that we will be posting. And we look for you to transition these learnings and themes by taking active and actionable steps and initiatives to combat anti-racism efforts in this digital space. So as mentioned prior to the presentation, our intention for the speaker series is to eradicate racism through both small and large steps towards change. 
And as such, we have created the call to action to move the teachings and learnings from today's podcast session forward. So we challenge every listener here of today's podcast to participate in one act of change. This could be having a conversation with a neighbor or a colleague about something that resonated with you from today's podcast. It could be creating a lesson plan or a workshop or session on anti-racism and including all voices and peoples um throughout this digital realm and beyond so you can use the hashtag um met or hashtag ubc anti-racism but uh, when it comes to the availability of impactful cultural sensitive and relevant lesson plans that address anti-racism there are very limited resources so that we are urging you on a grander gesture for um, interested listeners today to submit a lesson plan. And it is Edith Lando's um, Digital Learning Center that provides us the affordability um, and affordance to be able to offer a small grant to those individuals who are interested in eradicating racism through these lesson plans and using Dr. Richman's work within this context. So one last thank you to our amazing guest, Dr. Robert Eshman. It has been such a pleasure. We really appreciate you being here today, offering um, your incredible teachings that you have now in your book. And I'm sure so much will hit home with so many individuals um, and peoples. It was such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me. This is a great conversation. Thank you everyone for listening.